so thank you for joining my talk uh, about how to uh, misuse different technologies to build kiosks that run on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so we've all seen the interesting ways that Kubernetes can fail in the wild, right? Uh, depending on the situation, it can be humorous in this case, or probably very annoying in this case. Uh, or especially like if you're like working with like an infotainment system where what happens actually doesn't matter all that much, uh, or potentially unsafe in the ca in the case of a factory control system. Uh, many times we treat these applications as appliances where everything gets loaded onto a disk and then shipped to the location uh, where you have limited tools uh, or limited uh, uh, technicians to detect failure conditions or automatically um, resolve the issue. Um, in this talk, I'm hoping to show off a, a project that I've been working on, really on and off, for about a year or two, um, where I have uh, containerized a desktop environment, specifically X11 uh, and Pulse Audio. And so, but first, why? Like, why would you want to containerize uh, what many of us likely assume to be a core part of your Linux platform? Um, how does adding a layer of complexity, or in this case, in the case of Kubernetes, several, uh, result in a better experience? Um, as an aside, I know that we're, uh, we have a pretty wide range of backgrounds in this audience. Um, so I might be going through some, uh, some more basic stuff uh, that you might already know. So please bear with me if you're one of the more technical people in here. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, keep things mostly basic with some deep dives. We'll see. Um, so, I would argue um, that the, the technical reasons matter less uh, for than how it affects the people in process. Um, most, of these most of the reasons for containerizing uh, are the same that we've been preaching for eight to 10 years or so, or honestly longer if you've been using solar zones. Um, yeah, a system like this uh, allows for developers to not have to be concerned with anything uh, below their application uh, and they also get to work with the language of their choice to build their applications, right? So they're not just locked into, um, say, for example, like an uh, Android, you would have to write with a language that can compile for Android or iOS. You have to write in Objective-C. Um, yeah, uh, for the maintainers, myself, the company that I work for, uh, it allows us to split the roles and responsibilities uh, across uh, more fine-grained components without incurring additional technical debt which means that we can actually turn around and give a, uh, a better standard of uh, stability and maintenance uh, for the products and projects that we're working on. Um, also, it can allow for uh, smaller portions of the stack to be updated at each time, uh, which for environments where you say have a less than ideal network conditions or completely air gapped, um, this means that you could actually have over-the-air uh, updates because you have those smaller uh, chunks that have to, to have to be loaded to be updated. Um, lastly, it can allow for sharing uh, the compute that's driving the displays uh, to be able to run other workloads that might otherwise need a cluster in somewhere else, say the back office, random closet, under somebody's desk, wherever. Um, and this can save uh, on hardware, uh, networking power, and space. Um, yeah, for example, the screen shown here, uh, each of those screens probably has a computer embedded uh, in it that's probably not using all of its resources. So if you could share those resources across uh, a larger cluster, then you're able to offload the need for as much uh, compute that's in the back office. Uh, so it can also turn around and like, save, you, save you some money uh, on your deployments. Along with the process bits, uh, there's some security benefits uh, to be found. Um, I remember seeing an article a couple years ago on Hacker News uh, where somebody had gained access to a point of sale system uh, by asking it to print the terms and conditions and then telling the print dialog to use uh, the terminal to, do the, to print it, which means that it turned around and opened up the terminal, um, like a good computer would. Uh, yeah, so. That's a, a very interesting kind of security uh, uh, vulnerability, like a really weird attack vector that you probably wouldn't expect, right? Um, with containers and Kubernetes, uh, we can help mitigate attack vectors like this, right? Um, so because it's in the container, right, we, we naturally uh, are living in a network namespace with uh, ANSI groups. Um, 
And we can also build our containers uh, so that they don't even have a shell to access and open up, uh, much less any access past that. Uh, we also get all of the CNCF uh, security landscape projects uh, that we get for free. Um, for example, I've been working with Buoyant uh, on Linkerd a bit, uh, and we have been chatting about like, hey, how do we um, uh, have the service mesh work along with this, right? So now you get observability and you're able to, um, yeah, uh, isolate different traffic uh, patterns across. So you can very, uh, you can set very fine grained rules um, for that. Uh, similarly, uh, one of the projects that uh, that SUSE works on is a new vector, which allows you to look at uh, process tables, and so you can make sure that processes don't even don't start um, when somebody's trying to to attack your system. Um, yeah, and also again, the the updates uh, because of smaller components, you can have more discrete update cycles. So, say you've got a, a vulnerability in one of your containers. Um, yeah, you're able to just update that one without having to affect the entire stack. Again, at in an edge environment where you might have limited bandwidth, uh, every byte that you don't have to transmit can be a potential cost saving or potential ability, can change your ability to actually do that update or not. So hopefully you agree that this is a good idea. Um, so how? So there are three containers in the pod that, that I built. Um, on the right, uh, you've got X11, uh, which is uh, running the actual display and the rendering of, um, of the, the screen. Uh, on the left, you've got Pulse Audio uh, for the sound. And in the middle, you've got the workload itself. Uh, Pulse Audio and X11 uh, come up as sidecars, uh, init containers with restart uh, always uh, set. Uh, so that way, they come up uh, first. Um, if the workload comes up first, uh, then X11 Pulse Audio probably didn't have a chance to do the uh, configuration of the setup that it would need uh, to start with. So uh, each of these communicates uh, with each other through sockets that are created in the empty directories. Um, the, yeah, the X11 comes up first, generates this required cookie for, uh, for the X authority file, and adds it to the right directory. Then the uh, GUI workload can pick it up when it spins up next. Um, also worth noting, each of the components, uh, each of the containers comes with a base configuration included. Uh, but those can obviously be overwritten uh, with custom config maps. Um, also for any students in, in the audience, uh, document your code, because I don't actually remember why I did three different um, empty dirs. Realized that yesterday when I was writing the slides and went, oh, I wonder. Someday I'll learn. Um, so how do you container, container your application itself? Uh, you have two basic options. Either you can use a browser and uh, host a web app, or you can build your own native application. Right. Uh, uh, when you're working with a web app, uh, we've got a contain, uh, container that, container that uh, has Firefox uh, installed in it uh, that automatically starts up with the kiosk flag, so it comes up full screen. Um, you also want to disallow key combos uh, via the X keyboard map um, configuration. And, um, one of, the, one of the cool things about this is that the site that you're loading can be a service uh, in uh, the Kubernetes cluster because you're already local to that Kubernetes cluster, so all of the normal uh, routing and uh, DNS resolution just works. Uh, or if you want a little bit more, something a little bit more custom or you're just more comfortable uh, writing on a native app, um, you, can, you can definitely build your own container using that. Uh, there's a couple things that you, you need to uh, make sure to load. Um, there's a couple, or a couple uh, libraries. Uh, specifically, you need your fonts. I'll tell a funny story about that in a bit. Uh, you need um, uh, the X11 libraries. You need the GTK libraries, libpulse, and libA sound if you want sound. Um, and as expected, uh, Electron, Tari, and any of the like, standard UI frameworks work uh, like, you would, like you would expect. Um, so you don't need to read this whole slide. 
but I did include it uh, because I found a lot of companies care uh, quite a bit about what's being displayed uh, even in the case of a failure at some layer of the stack. Uh, because we all deal with software, software will eventually fail. So um, uh, the main point of the slide is that each layer kind of builds on itself. Uh, and so whenever a layer above it fails, uh, the, there's, the reconciliation loop will go ahead and restart it. Um, and what's shown while it's being restarted is what the layer under it uh, wanted to show. So you can brand kind of all the way from uh, start to finish. Um, yeah. So now for my favorite part of any talk. Um, what all did I break on the way? <laughs> um, so first off, I found that there is a lack of documentation, or I was just not great at finding it. Um, uh, around how the components internal to, to X11 and Pulse, Pulse Audio uh, work together, uh, especially when uh, trying to get them to do stuff that is outside of what the, the developers actually intended. Um, I, I did try my best to make sure that like, we, were just, we were using maintainable and supportable um, uh, APIs through the entire thing, which I, I think we succeeded at. Um, yeah, that said, I do want to call out that the Arch Wiki was awesome. Uh, just amazing resource uh, through this whole process. Uh, and if anybody here contributes to the Arch Wiki, thank you. Uh, it's a great, great place to look. Um, also, learning uh, what permissions were needed uh, was a bit of a challenge due to the lack of documentation at times, right? So it ended up being a bit of a guess and check. Um, and just, yeah, turning, turning different permissions off, going, hey, crap, that broke something. OK, maybe I need that one. Um, yeah, next, uh, fairly early on, I, was <laughs> burn I burned at least a week and apologized to my managers, uh, trying to figure out why I was only seeing a white screen get rendered uh, when loading a basic HTML file. It turns out that it was working, uh, but I hadn't installed any fonts, so the, brown so the browser rendered a blank screen because I hadn't added any CSS. Um, that took, yeah, at least a, a week to figure out. I actually had to like wire in a whole debugger for the for uh, Chrome to see like what was Chrome trying to do, right? Um, yeah, good times. Uh, yeah, similarly, I learned the hard way that Pulse Audio treats volume and muting as separate controls. Uh, so when I set the volume to 100, expecting to hear something come through the speakers, I didn't. And that probably took at least two or three days to go, oh, hey, there's this mute control as well. I should probably uh, turn that on. Uh, as soon as I unmuted it, it just worked. Yay. Um, lastly, I definitely scored an own goal yesterday. Uh, when I learned that setting no mode, no mode set as a kernel arg, uh, which I was needing for some other demos, uh, stops X11 from working, um, which makes a lot of sense, but was, uh, yeah, that was frustrating to learn as well. Um, so going forward, um, we're going to work on shrinking the image size. Uh, right now, kind of pulled in all the packages that I need without really any concerns for bloat. Um, so going to shrink that down uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm working with the engineers uh, at SUSE to um, uh, to build out a Podman and Systemd option as well uh, for the use cases where uh, Kubernetes might not be the right choice. Sacrilege while here, I know, but here we are. Um, also, we're going to switch to Pipewire for audio and Wayland uh, for, for graphics, uh, probably with Cage. Um, the reason I picked, picked X11 and uh, Pulse Audio were because that's what I could find docs on for actually making do what I wanted them to do. Um, uh, is, I think it's also worth noting that there is a reasonable migration path from this stack to the future stack, because uh, Pipeware can also talk to Pulse Audio uh, um, API, I don't know, whatever that's called. Um, and uh, Wayland with X Wayland can, can talk X11, so. Um, also, uh, one, of, one of the customers I'm working with um, uh, asked for VNC uh, based on the, the way that they're handling operations. 
And uh, so one of the things that I'm looking at, and I don't actually know if this is possible or not, but is possibly running a VNC server as an ephemeral container so that you can start it up more ad hoc. Um, I think that'll be a really interesting use of, of ephemeral containers, and I'm kind of interested to see if that actually works the way I would expect it to. Um, I'm also looking at building a cloud native, cloud native build pack that is harder to say than it should be. Um, so that way you can just like push your code or use uh, the pack command and not have to worry about like Docker files and that type of thing. Uh, lastly, documentation. Documentation is always important. I've written what I know. Uh, and so working on actually fleshing that out and making it uh, super useful. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, let's, uh, if anybody's got some questions, we've got some time. And there is a demo, our booth is like right outside the door and we have a demo that'll be set up shortly. Thank you.